Hey everybody, so this is a new segment, as you know, as I said. Um, we are calling it Thinking in the Rain, I guess. We'll come Morning, up good evening, good afternoon, though. or uh, I good hope you can get the rain effects because, uh, However, and whenever you some context may here, be it is raining. listening. I'm shorts. Thank you for stopping into another fantabulous episode in a matter of, of the Take It Easy and podcast. I wanted coming to, to you live on a through Thursday. The talk sports. We are going to talk about my ass off all and see, uh, sports this myself. morning. So, I was thinking about doing Purdue this segment. And got back I'm thinking at about UVA rain last night, and that naturally led me to think of raining. Revenge on for that elite parade. eight loss like, in overtime. You know the and, phrase "rain on your parade." Uh, and what's vengeance the for Carson Edwards? Okay, we've talked college basketball. An eight seed beating a one seed. The NBA is in a transition hockey, and that period. happened twice last year in the NHL And playoffs, this happens in all sports in leagues Conference where you're going from dynasty to dynasty. And then the I was thinking about the NBA. So the last time phase. that happened was 2012. And it started when the last year with took down the Raptors, a team I think who both franchises, uh, it didn't, was a turning because point for both franchises at that leaving. point because winning the championship the 76ers for them jump started to make this the playoffs that year, missed the playoffs phase. after a disappointing now, year, and began the, the teams process, that we are the traditionally used to being the powers of tanking the Warriors, and adding draft picks. Um, what was the in Cavs, order to try and improve their fortunes? And then Toronto, and, and Toronto was a powerhouse by Bulls, virtue of they won their defending champions. And they went from we're being now in a transition phase where contenders teams wow, are cold. trying to being perennial a assert themselves to, um, instantly or B, in a moment they're tanking uh, or well they added Jimmy Rick, Butler and some of the because, pieces are in the there. case they're of like kind the of Lakers, middle of the pack the Clippers, team like they become an eight for seed Kawhi that, that he is the, the Bulls, next great one. Almost, I mean they were up two for the Lakers. LeBron one is year. obviously out Man, to prove something. And for the rest of these teams, um, they're still trying to establish oh, themselves as dynasties. I forgot to bleep out and, the Well, F for word. Houston, actually. Um, Houston is trying so to make a the Bulls, one last stand yeah, and charge to that try happened. and so keep their dynasty alive. I was thinking that this year is probably the most likely in year its current for iteration to take down a one seed um, in both conferences. So yes, for the, the rest of these teams, good, the Bucks, the Sixers, the Celtics, the Heat, about the, the uh, who are the other good so teams, the Nuggets. teams like Utah. All right, those guys and all those teams down below, Utah, including Dallas like, and all those teams that aren't good. really competing Their ceiling for is like the at this point. They're trying to establish that, themselves as the next great so, team in the NBA league as we head to the next period, decade. Which is unique. Maybe the league that is more prominently year, like in a transition phase are prime for that is the NHL. goes, you can see, and that was clear last year when they were coming off of talented seven. What was the previous dynasty of or 2016 like to 2018? A lot of options for was the on Pittsburgh and Washington year. dominated era. And, uh, they played each other in the playoffs yeah, every year. The winner of their series that. went on the to win the Stanley Cup for three NBA, straight obviously, years. An era no team has dominated by the Penguins more than and the stars. Capitals. I think if those LeBron were the two teams, this year, the way the Warriors and Cavs if defined LeBron basketball for a four-year stretch. Probably his most impressive performance in hockey. It was the Penguins and the Capitals. The era before that, from 2015 to 2011. That are trying to LA Kings, Chicago Blackhawks, battling it out every year. It was and a transition phase if old away LeBron, from that. I know that they um, have the best tandem in the league. A transition AD, into the Penguins LeBron winning back this back age, and the Capitals were to be able to all encapsulated in one era these because, young as I said, the Penguins and Capitals rise, played in the playoffs every I think single it would be year. A testament to his they would have played in the conference finals every single year if hockey playoffs great. permitted it. And yeah, Their formatting is strange, so they played in the divisional round every year based on... Finally what get division to go they indoors. played in. It's very strange. But you indoors. We knew they were in a transition phase last indoors, year. So and that was been. part of why the playoffs Whatever, were, we're so ridiculous last future, year. Because we'll everyone felt they had a chance. Here. And there was no defined team that you knew they are significantly better than everyone else. If there was that team, it was the Tampa Bay Lightning. And they got swept out in the first round of the playoffs. As we mentioned yesterday, on the 10 most disappointing teams, one of the strangest stories, strangest events, upsets, whatever, in of the decade. And that allowed the St. Louis Blues, a team that in, in January of last year was dead last in the NHL. Honestly, on, June, on January 3rd, they were dead last in the Western Conference um, to win the Stanley Cup post firing a coach, post going down in their series, both series, the Stanley Cup Final and the Western Conference Final. 
and they end up winning the Stanley Cup. And it feels like they're still in a transition period. Sometimes the transition period turns out to be not a transition period and we just can't see it in the moment. Obviously, this was a transition away from Washington and Pittsburgh to whoever's coming next. And what makes me interested is that when you look at the Stanley Cup standings right now in terms of the playoff, the two best teams in hockey right now are, I'm sorry, the best team is the Capitals, but then the next two teams are Boston, went to the Stanley Cup final last year, and St. Louis won the Stanley Cup final last year. And if you would have told me that at the start of the year, it would have seemed unlikely simply because St. Louis, they've won the Stanley Cup, but it felt kind of random. And Boston lost the Stanley Cup, but it also felt they were a great team. They were probably a better team than the Blues, but it felt random that they had gotten there because the Islanders swept Pittsburgh out of the playoffs, and then the Hurricanes, who were a wild card, made it to the conference finals. And all the division winners took L's in the playoffs. And it was very unpredictable, ridiculous. And the Blues were a feel-good story to win the Stanley Cup. It was like Washington winning in the MLB last year. Such a feel-good story. And it made me realize that, A, the transition period may not be in a full effect the way we thought, or B, that maybe the Blues and the Bruins are destined to uh, dominate the league for a period of time and uh, it'll be interesting to see is the conclusion I can make. I just, a theory, this is more game theory than anything else. So not to talk about myself too much here, but I had a very relaxing evening last night, very entrenched in the sports world. Um, by the sports world, I mean basketball. And I was watching, you know, you get the multiple basketball games going. You get your Lakers. You get uh, them whooping up on Donovan Mitchell and the Utah Jazz, despite the fact Mitchell had 29 points. I found out Donovan Mitchell is only a year younger than Giannis Antetokounmpo. That's pretty damn ridiculous of how good Giannis is going to be. Also, Mitchell is growing into, is coming into his own. It's just going a lot slower than... Uh, we're used to with some of these stars that jump out uh, that jump out off the page right away it's a slow process for Mitchell but you look at his rookie year uh, his famous rookie year at this point put up 20 points a game last year 21.7 and this year he's averaging 24 and his numbers just progressively go up across the board Mitchell is coming into his own in the league and uh People who feel like Utah um, hasn't reached their potential, it's a learning curve, especially when the future, the star player for your team going forward is 22, 23 years old. Um, it's important to know. So that's one thought, and I have five more. So I want to do this sofa thought style, and uh, well, not sofa thought style, um, pint size style. Sorry, that's another thing. So. Um, five topics, one minute each, of things, takeaways from watching the NBA last night. And of, I know single games don't matter as much, so big picture stuff. Five things I took away. Five, five takeaways. Wow, that was awful. Let's try that again. Five takeaways from the NBA last night. One. The Milwaukee Bucks are head above heels better than everyone else in the West, in the Eastern Conference. And I want to say, yes, Giannis's progressions make it that much important, but the team they built around him, very solid for what Giannis needs. Um, obviously, losing Brogdon was a huge deal, and paying Chris Middleton will, uh, will come back to bite them eventually. But Eric Bledsoe is growing into his own, and he is a go-to scorer whenever you need him. If Giannis, is, if Giannis is out of the game or Giannis isn't rolling, just Bledsoe can be that guy who just commands the offense. He doesn't get enough love, so I want to give him love. He's probably a top 15 point guard in the NBA at this point, um, teetering around that top 10. Brooke Lopez, obviously a very important piece. DJ Wilson, 
young player coming into his own. Wes Matthews is a sharpshooter, similar to what Brogdon had, but Brogdon in Indiana is more of a pure scorer. More on him in number two. Two. I have seen some things from the Lakers this year that make me feel as if they are head above heels, the best team in the Western Conference. I don't want to go as far to say that since the regular season does not matter to Kawhi Leonard or Paul George. The Clippers keep finding ways to win. There are obviously ways to take down the Lakers, but I think they're the way they've in, incorporated bigs into their lineup and big time at the basket, lots of pick and roll situations. Sometimes they'll have two big men on the floor at the same time who are still athletic enough where JaVale and Anthony Davis can play at the same time, Dwight and Anthony Davis, Dwight and maybe whatever, but the... The Lakers have found a way to coexist with multiple bigs on the floor. That's why they are one of the best defensive units in the league and by far head above heels, the best shot blocking team in the NBA. And they're 19 and three. Three. The Indiana Pacers have the same record as the Dallas Mavericks. And you don't have to tell me twice about small market versus big market discrepancies in the NBA or having a star like Luka Doncic versus having your best player be Malcolm Brogdon to start the season. But the Pacers, year in and year out, do this thing. They win a bunch of games at the start of the season. No one talks about them. And they end up being sneaky good. They're going to make the playoffs, uh, what is this now, for like the eighth straight season. They lose Paul George. They're the best player of the decade for that franchise. And they go to the playoffs what will be three straight seasons, uh, despite Victor Oladipo the player they got and has become a star missing almost a year due to a, a horrific injury he suffered last year. The Pacers find a way with budget and players that aren't household names, they always find a way. And this year it's been with Malcolm Brogdon and they lost Bogdanovich as well, who was a big hurt. But this year it's been about Brogdon. Miles Turner is a trade piece, but he's played great this year. I love the Pacers, and they have the same record as Wonder Kid Luka Doncic. Four. I'm probably the only journalist in America, not in either Oakland, San Francisco, or Charlotte, that watched a good portion of the Warriors and Hornets game last night. Shows you what I'm doing with a college education. I don't understand why Charlotte is winning this many games when it feels like they should be a tanking team. P.J. Washington, diamond in the rough, as they try to find at these stages. They've been trying to find diamonds in the rough forever because they're never bad enough to tank, but they're also not good enough to get a high, or they're not bad enough. They're not good enough to be anything special, but they're not bad enough to get a high draft pick. Their starting lineup was like Terry Rozier, Bridges, Devontae Graham, who has played pretty well. P.J. Washington and Bismack. Um, congrats to Charlotte. They whooped up on the Warriors with D'Lo and Draymond yesterday. A fine season being put together by these boys. Exactly what they didn't need after losing Kemba Walker. Very strange turn. Also, how are that? how is that Charlotte's Hornet team? And I told you their roster, Rozier, Graham, Bridges, P.J. Washington, and Bismack Biombo. How are they significantly better than the five-time defending Western Conference champions? Basketball is weird. Basketball is unpredictable, and the Warriors have had awful luck. Five. So the Celtics rolled the heat yesterday, and that's not the result you should point to because Miami uh, doesn't fare well after road back-to-backs. It could be a one-minute segment to rail on road back-to-backs, but I do want to talk about Miami and how consistent they've been this year. And I love their team going forward. The thing is, they do need to make a move, and it needs to be trading Justice Winslow to acquire another star-type player. Someone like a DeRozan, maybe, could be key, but I love the team as constructed with Jimmy Butler and the three youngins, uh, Kendrick Nunn, Tyler Hero, and Duncan Robinson being huge pieces. They are one of the most consistent teams in the league, and they also win games on the road that other teams don't. In terms of the only time Toronto has lost at home this year, Miami, and the only time 
uh, Philly has lost at home this year, I believe, with Miami. It was either Philly or Boston. I don't know. Miami is very stable and a legitimate team that could win a playoff series. And if the Bucks or the Sixers get them in the conference finals, the Heat may not take them down, but those teams will remember that series. They'll give them a run for their money. All right, before we get into Thursday night football, let's talk about the Major League Baseball hot stove, and it is catching fire. The winter meetings start on Sunday, and I really want to talk about that. I'm going to really continue talking about that because I believe we're going to see some significant moves being pulled within that week. I don't know how big of players will sign. I don't know which players will be traded. The trade market provides a lot of option for stars. But let's talk about what's already happened now. Uh, the Miami Marlins brought in two significant players. Yes, we are talking Miami Marlins baseball in December on a podcast. That's right. They brought in Jonathan VR, who had a four wins above replacement last year. Should significantly increase their chances this year, especially since Starling Marte is gone. Um, Hassan Diaz is what they hope will be the future second baseman. But to be fair, uh, anytime you can get Jonathan VR at this point, it seems like a good idea. It tells you the state of the 2020 Orioles that they were not willing to bring back a player who, again, provided them four wins above replacement last year. This is the third year of their rebuild, and there's just no sign of anything good coming soon. Um, Better to be bad, though, than be in the middle if you're one of these baseball teams. Uh, And they also brought in Jesus Aguiar, trying to find his uh, revival a little bit. A lot of players were released, and it's squeezing the middle class down. Guys like Kevin P.R., um, lots of these middle class players who got released Blake Trinan won reliever of the year in 2018 down year for sure in 2019 still ended up getting released Padres traded for jerks in Profar which um, if you want me to break down that move they gave up their third string catcher who was not going to find much playing time barring injuries to one of the main catchers um So, in essence, they bring in Profar, who is a utility guy, likely to play some second base if he can put up the numbers like he did in Texas in 2018. It would make life a whole lot better for the Padres, and he could add a couple wins above replacement to a squad that really is... uh, has to take a next step this year. Otherwise, there will be jobs that are costed within that organization and there were a couple big moves with pitchers yesterday. So the Braves brought in Cole Hamels, one-year deal, significantly boosts that rotation, and it gives them a veteran you can look at and say, yes, we can trust that guy come playoff time. Because before they had great pitchers, but they were all young pitchers. Max Freed, Mike Soroka were their two best players. It was Fulton who has been around for a while, but Fulton doesn't command star, um, even if he was a bit of a veteran presence. And he also got the boat rocked on him in that game five against the Cardinals when he gave up eight runs before being yanked in the first inning. And they gave up 10 runs in the first. So obviously now it puts a damper on his great season. So adding Cole Hamels, $18 million a year, it's the same idea they did with Donaldson last year, a one-year deal to really, uh, really improve the team. They throw big money because the Phillies, their division rival, offered Hamels $9 million a year and for one year, and the Braves just doubled that, and Hamels is like, where do I sign? Right there? Okay, excellent. And the big move... The first major free agent domino to sign was Zach Wheeler, netting a $118 million contract with the Philadelphia Phillies, an offer that the White Sox topped, and once again, teams just chose to not sign there, or players chose not to sign there, i.e. Manny Machado. The dominoes are slowly following. 
falling. The Brewers added a catcher in, um, well, actually, Grandal went to the White Sox, now that I think about that. Um, they brought in, um, what's his name, Omar Navarez from the uh, Chicago White Sox. I mean, the uh, was on the Chicago White Sox and then uh, was on the Mariners last year. Um, yeah, that's not really important. Oh, the Angels traded for Dylan Bundy. That's the other thing. They gave up like four small prospects, which is exactly what the Orioles need, just as many potential hits as possible. So back to the Wheeler signing, though, which is obviously the big move of the day because the Phillies are paying stupid money, and they went from having lots of available cap space to being a little bit cap-strapped on the books now. Um, when you look at what they gave McCutcheon and what they gave Bryce Harper, with Arietta still under contract, which was a big lure away from the Cubs, to Gene Segura, to what will inevitably be Reese Hoskins, but that's not hurting them right now, to what they just paid Wheeler, which is a lot of money to be a number two. Uh, sometimes you have to do it because it's not what you're paying the pitcher, it's what you're paying to help win a World Series. If you win a World Series, it doesn't matter what you're putting on the books. But it is a, uh, it's an odd strategy to go about considering that you have the defending world champs in your division. You have the Marlins are going to be better than they were last year. Uh, the Braves are obviously won the division last year, still coming back. They look like the next big team on the rise. They had to make a, a move and they added Wheeler. This all sets the stage for the pitching market to fall. And Cole and Strasburg were going to get their own no matter what. It's a matter of when they'll get their own. Um, and the other thing is when Bumgarner signs now. And Bumgarner has a market now. Because those teams that really were interested in uh, Zach Wheeler, they're really going to want to go get Bumgarner now. If we're talking the Brewers, if the Brewers are willing to dish out that money, but they're also... They're keeping their books in check this offseason. They let Grandal walk. They let Moustakis walk, which I didn't even get to talk about Moustakis. Um, but we'll get back to the Brewers and Moustakis. Um, yeah, they let Grandal walk. They let Moustakis walk. They have talked about trading Josh Hader in his prime because they can't afford to pay a top reliever. Brewers got to figure it out, but they should be better next year simply by the fact that everyone on that team is getting better and their best players are getting better and they maybe have a second baseman or shortstop of the future in Keston Hira, who will be the big piece going into next season. They need starting pitching and it's finally time to stop beating the bush and letting it go down the road. They got to address starting pitching now. The White Sox are eager to pay somebody and they did that with Grandal. They brought back Jose Abreu, which was a little confusing considering Jose Abreu had very similar numbers to uh, another first baseman who just signed a, a short, short one-year deal for $5 million or something. I forgot. Oh, C.J. Cron uh, just got DFA'd um, or non-tendered by the Minnesota Twins, and he puts up similar numbers to Jose Abreu, and Abreu got a $50 million contract extension. Uh, the power of loyalty and the power of playing for a team that's not okay or not upset dishing out some stupid money now and then like the White Sox are clearly willing to do. Moustakis finally got that long-term deal and it came from Cincinnati. The Reds are once again committed to, hey, we're going to go for it in 2020. We're not going to accept being the bitter, the laughing stock of the division. We're going to go for it in 2020, which is exactly what they did last offseason. And they took over the winter meetings because they traded for Sonny Gray and Matt Kemp and Yasiel Puig and Tanner Roark. And then they ended up not winning anything. But now they're saying, hey, 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 we're just going to retool and go for it again. They've already started that with Moustakis, and we'll see what they do to address starting pitching within the next few days. Winter meetings start on Sunday. I am excited. I always love the transaction, especially in baseball. Last year, I spent five hours watching winter meeting coverage where almost no trades went down. 
I love it. This year should be more exciting since the market is moving faster. Players want to sign contracts sooner rather than later because teams are willing to dish them out this year because of how strong this, how deep and how strong this class is. Uh, Cole Scherzer, I mean Cole Strasburg, Rendon, Donaldson, Bumgarner, all these dudes should be moving within a very near future, including maybe Ozuna and Castellanos in terms of tier two outfielder guys. I've heard connections with both Texas and the White Sox for both of them. Again, Ozuna, most consistent thing about him is his inconsistency. You've seen Cole interview with the Yankees, Strasburg interview with the Yankees. Cole is floating these rumors around to create a market that there is no West Coast bias, obviously leaked by him and Boris because uh, they want to get other teams in on this competition, uh, even if ultimately he does go to either the Angels or the Dodgers or one of these West Coast teams, probably not the Padres, but that's okay. We've spent, I'm not mad. You've spent a lot of money the last two off seasons. You got us Haas and you got us Machado, and I'm happy with that. Strasburg's market developing slowly. Again, probably not the Padres. <sighs> And Rendon has sat down with both the Dodgers and the Rangers. This is a very critical offseason for the Dodgers. I hope they don't make any moves because Rendon obviously makes them better than they were. Um, for Texas, just Rendon, be the third baseman of the future in Texas. Texas is my second favorite team. Be the third baseman of the future. We'll give you whatever you want. And this all leads up to the trade market that is going to develop during the winter meetings as well. We talked free agents and those might not sign, but we're looking at a huge bump on the trade market. They're talking about Lindor. It's inevitable he'll be traded this offseason. Does that happen when everyone's together at the winter meetings like Stanton did two years ago? Uh, Chris Bryant and the, the Cubs are eager to move someone and just change it up. Is it Contreras? Is it Wilson? Bra uh, is it Wilson Contreras? Is it Chris Bryant? I don't think it'll be Rizzo. Could it be um, Albert Almora gets moved? Could it be Schwarber? Who knows? The Cubs are eager to make a move though, and of course, the big domino hanging over is Mookie Betts. It's David Price. It's Nathan Evaldi. And those two could be packaged together in a deal, and it would make a lot of sense on the Boston front, considering that they aren't too interested in a full-scale rebuild and a lot of prospects. It would take Major League Capital to get those players away, and I think they would be more than willing to part with a couple starting pitchers, and I think a couple teams would be more than willing to take on those contracts now to push themselves forward into the future why the Padres have fallen out of the race because they don't have the major league ready talent but they're trying to move Will Myers so maybe that could be a uh, match made in heaven or depending on who you ask a match made in hell so winter meetings get underway next week trade market is on fire free agents are starting to sign which is a sign that the pitching market will start to move very quickly and Garrett Cole and Strasburg, some teams may want to announce it during the winter meetings. Be prepared. Since we might not be able to talk about baseball until Tuesday, given, you know, football is king, especially this time of the year, especially when the Niners and Saints are playing this weekend and the Chiefs and the Patriots and the Seahawks and the Rams. Oh, my God. Let's talk football now. Hit that transition music. All right, so Thursday night football tonight is marred in mediocrity as the Cowboys and the Chicago Bears, who are both firmly in the mixies, as we affirmed on Tuesday. Go check that out. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Anchor, Google Podcasts, iTunes on desktop. Um, we've firmly established those teams are in the mix, and Dallas is looking for their next big uh, win to kind of vault them ahead of... Uh, the Eagles, a little leeway before their Week 16 matchup, which I affirm will end up deciding the winner of the NFC East. Whoever wins that matchup, that's for the Bears. It's a long up road, uphill trek, but the good news is they play the Vikings still, so you can try and make a comeback that way. They also play the Rams coming up, so 
Chicago is firmly in it. They need this win, though. I think both teams need this win, but Chicago could really make some headway if they get this win against the Cowboys tonight. Why do I say that? If we're doing it purely on math, you look at the, the Vikings are 8-4, and four, the Rams are 7-5, and five, the Bears are 6-6. Six and six. Only one of those teams will get into the playoffs. The Bears this weekend take on the Cowboys. If they win that, they're set seven and six. They're right in it. And what happens is uh, the Rams play the Seahawks. Real chance they can lose that game. The Minnesota Vikings. The Minnesota Vikings, I don't know who they play, but it's not that important. The important thing on that front. Uh, the Vikings play the Lions. It's not that important. But the important thing on that front is that the Bears have a difficult schedule the rest of the way. They play the Packers, the Chiefs, and the Vikings. Very difficult matchups, and they need wins. If they get this one, and they can pull off some of these later wins, especially against the Vikings, the Bears could make a playoff run. Is that very likely? No. I think the Bears have a 17% chance of making the playoffs right now. Even that seems a little bit high for them. They're in that same purgatory as the Titans, except they're starting from two games back instead of the Titans being tied with the Steelers for the sixth wildcard spot. Schedule's just a bleep to end the season. Um, Before, I mean, we can talk about more about the game, but who wants to talk about Trubisky anymore? I mean, talking about Trubisky for 11 weeks is just like, So let's talk about the coaches because both of them have been critiqued hard this year. They're both on the hot seat, even if Mr. Garrett's is a little bit hotter than uh, Matt Nagy's. Jerry doesn't want to rush into a decision, and this is not hockey. Firing a coach midseason does not mean you can go on a run to the Stanley Cup final like the Blues did last year. Firing a coach means you are punting on this season and you want to see um, what this next, what the coach who takes over, if they have anything that uh, would intrigue you to hire them long term. Think what Bill Callahan is doing in Washington and uh, whoever the coach is going to be in Carolina is about to uh, undergo. Or what Dan Campbell, uh, do you remember Dan Campbell? He's basically been that every stop he goes. It's like, you know, is he worthy of a head coaching job? Um, I think he's with the Saints now, so shout out to Man Campbell. Um, so Garrett needs this win to keep their season alive and to keep his job hopes alive because they do need to win a playoff game or something coming up during the postseason. They need to at least show signs of life if he wants to keep his job um, and if Zeke wants to stay, and if you don't want to blow this thing up because Dak, is, again, is on an expiring deal, he's leading the league in passing yards, which tells you all you need to know about that offense. It is doing well, considering that he's up there with other people, um, and Zeke has not been there. They've been more pass-oriented. Kellen Moore is a real candidate to take over for Garrett. It would be interesting if they gave him the keys to the car, though especially what would be a uh, trial year. It would make a lot of sense, though, if they do what I say. They trade Zeke, give Amari a fair deal. If he comes back, he comes back. Franchise Dak for one year. If you're going to restart this thing, and this team has peaked as much as it seems strange to think, considering that only three years ago they were right in the thick of things, or Dak and Zeke were rookies and the number one seed, as much as it's crazy to think they have peaked, And if you want to restart this thing with all those contracts you've dealt out to defensive players and the offensive line, if you want to restart this thing, it makes all the sense in the world to hire Kellen Moore as your next coach. Will will Jason Garrett get fired? I don't know. I like to think not, but we'll see after tonight. This game is marred in mediocrity and the Cowboys and the Bears need a win, otherwise their season's over. If the Cowboys lose tonight it could really start a panic button considering if all eyes weren't on them on thanksgiving 
all eyes are going to be on them tonight. So that's today's episode. We covered all sports today, and we got conference championship weekend coming up, Oregon and Utah on Friday, but we'll talk to you before then. We did cover all sports today, including hockey, including college basketball. Great episode today. I love every single one of you, and thank you to the loyalist of listeners. And if this is your first time, I hope I've bred a loyal listener out of you. Please support us. Rate, review, subscribe, download, uh, follow, all the good stuff. Please leave five-star ratings. Those are big things for growing. If you're on Apple Podcasts, just subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe, unsubscribe. Um, Do that for a little bit. Thanks, everybody. And as always, take it easy. We'll talk to you on Friday with our weekend preview. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.